Around the world, nine million criminals behind bars. Armed robbers, rapists and murderers. Most surrender to incarceration, but some fight back and escape. Tonight, a female warder springs her lover and goes on a shooting spree. All I could think of the future was Peter and I together, that's all I thought of. In Britain, bank robbing MI6 brothers break out under the noses of their guards. What do you mean you can't find them? I can't find the little Johns. And in America... Richard McNair is by far the most cunning and intelligent criminal out there. I'm not no damn prison escaping. You'd have done run by now. The murderer on the run cons a cop. Have a good day now. Be careful, buddy. This program contains recreations. The prison breaks are real. Melbourne, Australia, 1993. 275 male prisoners are locked up at the Remand Centre in the heart of Melbourne city centre. A new state-of-the-art facility. Inside, 38-year-old Peter Robert Gibb, in and out of jail for the last 20 years. Peter Gibb was, a, a, I suppose, you could just best describe as a long-term career criminal. Peter's, Peter's a bit of a wacko. Peter Gibb, and still is for that matter. Gibbs' latest sentence was 12 years for the armed robbery of an armoured car on Valentine's Day, 1991. He was a fairly hardened and experienced criminal. But even hardened criminals have a softer side. His was 28-year-old mother of two, prison officer Heather Parker, whose marriage was on the rocks. Well, at first I didn't notice him. I mean, a prisoner's a prisoner, you know, that kind of thing. Back in 1992, a fellow prison officer found that the door to a linen closet in the remand centre was locked. When the closet was finally opened, a red-faced Heather Parker came out first, followed by Peter Gibb. They crossed the line, so to speak. I found the right man. It's just unfortunate circumstances around us have made it very difficult. She um, had this liaison with Peter Gibb, uh, which compromised the security of the prison. The scandal rocked the corrections department. They didn't want her to work in the prison, they didn't want to work with her, and the, the, the organisation had to transfer to another, another area of, the, of corrections. Heather was sent to work at the corrections head office in South Melbourne, forbidden any contact with Gibb. And with Gibb facing a 12-year stretch, love struck Heather Parker was desperate. Her new job gave her access to restricted files that revealed the prison's secrets and weak points. Knowing it would be the end of her career, Parker hatched a plan to break out her jailbird boyfriend. If you look at prisons, generally there's bars on windows, and uh, with that prison there was no bars on the windows, neither was there any razor ribbon around the perimeter. Instead, the Melbourne Remand Centre relied on bullet-resistant polycarbonate windows. Heather saw this as the weak point. Banned from seeing each other, Parker and Gibb recruited career criminal Archie Butterley to act as their go-between and help pull off the breakout. 7th of March, 1993. During a prison boxing match, Peter and Archie make their move. It's speculated that the, the, in the boxing tournament, that when, when the equipment came in, one of the mouth guards was actually plastic explosive. As Butterley keeps watch for passing guards, Gibb sticks the plastic explosive to the window. After inserting a detonator, they push an industrial floor polisher up against the window to deflect the blast. A deafening explosion rocks the building as the bulletproof glass shatters. Gibb, dazed but desperate to escape, knocks out the remains of the window with his feet. With the whole prison now on full alert, they have only seconds to make their getaway. Mountjoy Prison, Dublin, Ireland. Built in 1850, it was the last stop for convicts bound for Australia and Ireland's hanging prison for a hundred years. Nicknamed the Joy, it was tough and squalid, one of the hardest places to do time in Ireland. Conditions at that time were very poor. 
just the basics, you know, bed, uh, three meals a day. In 1973, over 500 of Ireland's most dangerous criminals were locked inside. Among them, members of the Irish Republican Army, the infamous IRA. The joy was considered a hard nut to crack. The two desperate men were about to pull off the impossible. Their brazen breakout would humiliate the guards and in a shocking revelation, embarrass the British government. Bank robbing brothers, 32-year-old Kenneth and 29-year-old Keith Littlejohn, had just been sentenced to a total of 35 years for pulling off the biggest heist in Ireland's history. 67,000 pounds from a Dublin bank. But it wasn't their brazen holdup that made the brothers famous. It was their claim that to be British Secret Service agents sent to Ireland to spy on the IRA. As part of their mission for MI6, they were to rob Irish banks to discredit the IRA. I was cleared to rob banks under certain situations. In a post-escape BBC interview, Ken made his astonishing claim. We would discuss it, what was going to happen, who was going to take part in it, when it was going to take place, and why. Even though the brothers had pocketed all the stolen money, they still demanded the protection of the British government. I think that the, the British authorities really just wanted to cut their ties with these people. I think they realised they had made a really bad mistake by getting them involved and really basically wanted to have nothing to do with them. Abandoned by their government, Ken and Keith were now surrounded by the very IRA men they had been sent to spy on. In the heart of Ireland's Mountjoy prison, MI6 agents are walking targets. They were coming down for their tea or something like that. And as they were coming down the landing, they, they were attacked. After surviving the attack, the brothers are moved to isolation in the basement for their own safety. Through the barred windows, they can see the prison's perimeter wall. On the other side, lay freedom. Knowing they have been left to rot, the brothers come up with a plan. They got a cell to themselves, double cell for themselves, and they ended up getting a gym with punch bag and a few weights in it. Their next request is a briefcase. They were using the briefcase when their solicitor would come and visit them. They would bring the briefcase and they said they had documents relating to their appeal and their trial. The briefcase is, in fact, a personalised courier service. Inside is their get-out-of-jail card. Next, a convicted killer plans to post himself out of prison. He found the weakest link in the system. And the Melbourne jailbreak gets bloody. Team, we've got to report the member down. We've had a member shot. States Penitentiary, Pollock, Louisiana, a high security fortress with 1,500 of America's most dangerous prisoners caged behind its bars. Surrounded on all sides by the dense Kitachi forest, no one had ever escaped. But in April 2006, cold blooded killer Richard Lee McNair was bent on being the first. This smooth talking, two faced charmer was a consummate con man. He'd worked both sides of the law, as an undercover drug buyer for the police and as a petty thief, until killing a truck driver in a heist gone wrong. At that point, he went from being a two-bit thief to being a cold-blooded murderer. McNair was handed three life sentences for armed robbery, attempted murder, and murder. He's had several psychological evaluations conducted on him and uh, he tends to manipulate the psychologists, actually, who, who are evaluating him. Uh, he's been diagnosed as, uh, as a, having personality disorders, uh, being a sociopath, a psychopath. When convicted, McNair was serving as a sergeant in the United States Air Force 
trained in martial arts, survival skills, and the art of escape. Richard McNair is a chameleon. He is able to change his looks constantly, from long hair to short hair to beard, no beard, uh, you know, the way he dresses, the way he looks. McNair had twice escaped from other prisons. All prisoners who are serving a life from imprisonment uh, think about escaping. Uh, Mr. McNair just has the knowledge and the drive and the willingness to do so. In one attempt, he used stolen lip balm to slide out of handcuffs. Then they put him in the Bismarck jail. And that's where, you know, after a few years, he and a bunch of guys in Bible study, they decide that they're gonna escape through the roof. So he escapes through the ventilation system, crawls all the way through, gets out to the roof of the prison, jumps off, takes off running, wasn't seen for nine and a half months. So then he gets, he gets arrested and he gets caught for uh, breaking into a car dealership. McNair was incarcerated again. Back in prison, he focused on his next breakout. A lot of people do things to cope with being in prison. Mr. McNair plans of prison escapes. Through the process, the Freedom of Information Act was able to obtain all the documents, all the materials on his second escape, and even on his first escape, to learn what he did wrong so he wouldn't repeat the same mistakes again. McNair came up with a radical plan. He charmed his way into a skills training program for inmates. His job? Repairing mailbags. They had checks, yes. They were checking on their, their prisoners. They were keeping good, you know, a good track of them, of course. But at the end of the day, he found the weakest link in the system. McNair was ready to exploit that link with a special delivery. His daring plan? To post himself to freedom. In Australia, the peace on the streets of Melbourne has been shattered. Prisoners Peter Gibb and Archie Butler have blasted their way out of the Melbourne Remand Centre. An escape made possible through the help of Peter Gibb's lover, jail warder Heather Parker. And they use bed sheets to lower themselves through the window and, and down onto the, onto the ground. As Butterley struggles to climb down the makeshift rope, he falls heavily onto the pavement and limps away. Gibb and Butterley pick up their getaway car and grab the loaded revolver left by Heather Parker. The fugitives speed into traffic, but after only 60 seconds, the high-speed escape turns into a demolition derby, with Gibb crashing into another vehicle. Without stopping, 20 seconds later, Gibb smashes the car into the entrance of the Westgate freeway. Both armed escapees, now injured from the crash, force a motorcyclist from his bike and disappear. Next thing I saw, a police car come racing up the road here, and the guy got his baton out and went running out to, up to the guys on the bike. One guy hopped off the bike, turned around and shot him a few times. Seeing we've got a report of a member down. We've had a member shot. Officer Trelaw has been shot twice in the chest. The other policeman dived for cover and returned fire, but the two prisoners managed to escape in the police car. Police believe one of the men is injured, possibly shot. As they escape in the stolen police car, Gibb and Butterley are now desperate to rendezvous with accomplice Heather Parker. And now, every available police officer is after these would-be cop killers. 30 detectives have taken part in raids on homes of known accomplices across Melbourne, but so far there have been no confirmed sightings of the two escapees. Once again, I can only urge the public not to approach under any circumstances. Gibb and Butterley dump the police vehicle at Riverside Quay, where witnesses see them meet up with Heather Parker. They were driven away by a woman in a black Suzuki Vitara four-wheel drive with the number plate DYV969. The lovers are finally reunited, but the escape has turned ugly, and there's worse to come. Life on the run will hold them headfirst into a gunfight. In Ireland, self-proclaimed MI6 bank robbers, Kenneth and Keith Littlejohn, have survived an attack by IRA prisoners. For their own protection, they are now locked in a basement cell. Very claustrophobic. 
very hard, I have no doubt, like that. If I was doing 20 years in that area, you'd be inhumane, really. But isolation suited the Little Johns just fine. They'd already persuaded the prison authorities to provide them with a personal gym. Prison guard Mick Kelly remembers taking the punch bag and weights to their cell. I thought it was crazy, but I was only doing what I was told. But what the guards don't know is that gym is a ruse, a cover for the Little John's escape bid. Their briefcase, allowed to pass without inspection, holds more than documents. Hidden in the lining is their escape tool. Right under the noses of their guards, Ken and Keith work tirelessly on their escape. While one brother noisily punches the bag, the other slowly cuts through the window bars. To hide the cuts, sooty toothpaste is smeared in the gaps. The plan seems to be working, but there's a problem. Both Ken and Keith are well built, and at over six feet tall, they are just too big to fit through the window bars once they've been cut. Well, I had to go through a very small gap, and I had to lose two stone to do it. But losing over 12 kilograms in a few weeks can arouse suspicion. So, like many of the IRA prisoners, they go on hunger strike. They claim it is to protest they're being held as political prisoners, but it's really the mother of all crash diets. We thought they were exercising, doing their boxing or, or whatever, but we know different now. For weeks, the brothers hack away at the bars. But once out, they will have a huge obstacle. The 25-foot perimeter wall. They need a rope. For months, the Little Johns have been tearing up prison bedding and painstakingly knotting it together. And the grappling iron was just made out of bits of scrap that I picked up around the prison. And the punch bag serves as more than a diversion. It doubles up as a secret locker for their escape equipment. Monday the 11th of March, 1974. As the rest of the prisoners are having their dinner, Ken cuts through the last window bar. It was an incredible small space. You'd find it very hard to think that somebody got out through there. Both brothers are able to squeeze through the tiny space and drop to the ground eight feet below. All that now stands between the Little Johns and Freedom is the 25-foot high perimeter wall. But they're having problems. As hard as he tries, Keith can't get the grappling hook to catch. They didn't plan that part of it very well, like. And I think what happened was that they threw the rope up, but there was nowhere on the, on the wall for the rope to get caught onto. So they had nothing to pull themselves up. Ten frustrating minutes have passed. Back in the isolation cell, it's time for the guard to check on the Little Johns. It was another officer, says to me, he says, I can't find him. And I says, what do you mean you can't find him? He says, I can't fucking find the Little Johns. After weeks of starvation and hacksawing, the Little John's desperate bid for escape is over. Or is it? No one, not even the escapees, could have dreamed of what was about to happen. The United States Penitentiary, Pollock, Louisiana, 2006. A prison with a formidable reputation. No one had ever escaped its walls until Richard Lee McNair, a cunning killer serving three life sentences, hatched a plan as dangerous as it was ingenious. In all of my experience of working on criminal cases over the last decade, Richard McNair is by far the most cunning and intelligent criminal out there. McNair had scammed a job repairing mailbags. His brainwave was to have himself shrink-wrapped inside them 
then shipped to freedom, a plan fraught with danger and requiring him to be fighting fit. He's also trained uh, himself in physical fitness. He ran for days and months and uh, to a point of running three hours a day. McNair's job gave him access to delivery times and destinations, but it didn't give him access to a container big enough to hide in. He needed to make one. He created this escape pod, is what we like to call it. And he, it was basically stacked with mail bags all around it. Now, on the morning of his escape, he finds an orange pallet for the base of the pod, puts it in the middle of his work area. Then he gets the frame of a cart and sticks it on top. Walks around to the middle and squats down Indian style. How he did this part, I don't know, because the man is six foot tall. Then gets a plastic container and sticks it over top of his head. And what the US Marshals believe, he did have help inside of the prison, because there's no way in the world he's going to be able to cover himself up with mailbags, shrink wrap himself into this pod and be lifted off site. He's planned everything down to the last detail, including a sharp knife to carve himself free once outside. He was um, pulling things in over time, things that he could tape onto his body, he would duct tape power bars and, and protein shakes and things like that onto his body. But how will he survive being shrink wrapped without suffocating? He created a ventilation tube. So it was this long tube that he could breathe through inside of this pod. Once McNair is squeezed into his pod, his accomplices seal the mailbags with plastic wrap. I don't know how McNair did this. I can barely breathe. I can barely move in here. I mean, I'm five foot four. McNair is six foot 200 pounds. McNair sits in his shrink-wrapped escape pod waiting for the truck. With soaring temperatures of over 30 degrees, can he survive? Coming up. It was scary, it was horrific. Aussie escapees ambush police. And that hit me just across the back of the leg there. And the Little John's escape plan comes unstuck. Melbourne, 1993. With the help of prison officer Heather Parker, Peter Gibb and Archie Butterley have just escaped from Melbourne Remand Centre. They used explosives to blast a window at the Remand Centre before using sheets knotted together to scale down the wall. After writing off their getaway car and commandeering a motorbike, the injured escapees crash again. We've got a report of a member down. We've had a member shot. They've shot a policeman, stole a police car, rendezvoused with Heather Parker and disappeared. After five days on the run, Peter Gibb and Heather Parker arrive at the remote Gaffney's Creek Hotel, 120 miles north of Melbourne. I was rather surprised at, uh, at the, the arrival of this unusual looking fellow. He had his arm in a sling, he had no socks on but a pair of shoes and he had a, a bald, a shaven head other than the, the sides which were had hair on them. And uh, he wanted accommodation for the night for himself and his wife and his young son. The badly injured Archie Butterley hides in their room while Gibb and Parker do their best to fit in with the locals. And I said, oh, please, come and have and join in with us. We were having a good time. So they ordered a meal, and I said, would you like me to take uh, fish and chips down to the child in the room? And they said, oh, no, 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 well, I'll take it down, but he's not having the fish and chips, he's having the steak, which I thought was unusual, but uh, you get lots of unusual things happening in Gaffney's Creek. And they joined in the festivities of the night and sang along with the guitar. Bill Gribble's suspicions intensify when Gibb purchases too much alcohol for a couple and their young son. And that was really the last I saw them. 6 a.m. the next morning. I heard shouting that I awoke to, and uh, I heard a voice saying, Bill, you've got a fire. 
a man fitting Gibbs' description, was staying at the Gaffney Creek Hotel. The hotel was burnt to the ground in the early hours of the morning. Police were tipped off to the escapee's whereabouts after the Gaffney's Creek pub burnt to the ground last night. The escapees had checked into the hotel. But the trio had vanished again, this time into the vast wilderness of the Australian bush. Very remote part of the state, very hilly, uh, with thick uh, trees and uh, steep tracks and roads. It's a very difficult place to, uh, to search. Armed, dangerous, and ready to use their firepower, Parker, Gibb, and Butterley are now the most wanted criminals in Australia. Dublin, Ireland, 1974. At the notorious Mountjoy prison, self-professed MI6 agents, Ken and Keith Littlejohn, have cut through their cell bars and escaped. But they're in trouble. Their carefully handmade rope and grappling hook won't catch on to the prison's 25-foot outer wall. And the brothers have already been missed. There was no sign of them because there was only the gym, their cell and the toilets. They were the only places they could have been. I, I couldn't believe it. These are two of the most important prisoners. And I says, this is it. This is my job. It's gone. <laughs> Unable to climb over the wall, Ken and Keith come to the crushing realisation they failed their only opportunity to escape. But as they walk along the perimeter wall, they make a staggering discovery. When the Little Johns got to the, the southeast corner of the prison by D-Wing exercise yard, that sort of end, um, there were four planks nearly the height of the wall. Now, in security prison, that's just not, that's a no-no. Yeah. It was an amazing stroke of luck. Building contractors had finished work for the day and had left some lumber behind. And this was manna from heaven. Hardly believing their good fortune, Keith and Ken make a ramp. Getting up the wall is easy. Getting down is the hard part. Keith tries his grappling hook, but drops it by mistake. With no easy way down, the Little Johns risk all. Older brother Ken makes it, but Keith isn't so lucky. The impact breaks his ankle. It's a disastrous blow to their escape bid. The United States Penitentiary, Pollock, Louisiana, April the 5th, 2006. No one had ever escaped, but convicted murderer Richard Lee McNair was dead set on being the first. Shrink-wrapped in a pallet of mailbags, he swelters in over 30 degrees heat, waiting for delivery by US Post. I would say it took years of planning for him to come up with this kind of escape, to be able to escape out of a maximum security prison in the United States. At 9 a.m., the pallet of bags with McNair inside is forklifted onto a truck and taken to a warehouse just half a mile outside the prison walls. At approximately um, 11 o'clock, they, they did a head count of all prisoners within the USP uh, Pollock Penitentiary and discovered they had one short. Believing no one could escape maximum security, guards first searched the prison. Meanwhile, in the warehouse, McNair is hacking his way out of his shrink-wrapped cocoon. I believe he was in there probably three to four hours before he was able to cut himself out. Finally free from his stifling escape pod, he slips out of the warehouse and runs for his life. His bold escape triggers a massive manhunt, which eventually reaches the warehouse. Guards find the pile of mailbags, plastic wrapping ripped open from inside. They've lost their first prisoner. Richard Lee McNair 
is running for his life, deep in the Kitachi Forest. But only eight miles into his newfound freedom, McNair is stopped while running along railway tracks by a state trooper. Do you have any form identification on you? No, man. What's your Robert, name? Robert Jones. Robert Jones? Uh-huh. Why, well, I'm not supposed to be on the tracks? No, that's not the problem right now. Where you, what's your address? I don't have an address. I'm at the hotel. We're working on uh, houses and stuff like that. Roofing. What it is, we got an escapee. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Where from? Uh, prison. There's a prison here? Yeah. Uh. Smooth-talking hey, McNair claims he's just an innocent jogger. He tells a good story, and uh, he makes it believable. And he was able to give some geographical areas that uh, the officer was familiar with. And he was also able to uh, kind of, uh, again, just disarm this officer and believing that he was not a prisoner at SKP because of his, uh, I guess, calming attitude. Amazingly, experienced officer Carl Bordelin swallows McNair's story. Carl knew that there may be a prison escapee, but he didn't have a lot of information. And with what he had, he did the best that he could interviewing this guy. And if you watch McNair in that video, he's so calm and so collected. No, 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 I'm not a prison escapee. How far you got a job to? Pineville, hopefully he's on these tracks. Yep. But out here, you're in civilian life, you know? Were you in the military? No, I wasn't. I'm retired army. He was just so collected in his thoughts and his words and his actions, and that was the most amazing thing. And that's really what won Carl over. Yeah, I'm not no damn prison escaping. You'd have done run by now. <laughs> you know that yourself. <laughs> the exchange lasts 10 minutes until McNair jugs off. Free again. Be careful, buddy. Thank you. All right. After McNair conned the officer, he was able to uh, jump a train, a cargo train, and go north of Louisiana, approximately 120 miles. From there, he stole the vehicle and uh, drove to South Texas. McNair writes to his parents, claiming he's heading south to Mexico. Instead, he goes north to Canada, stealing cars and money on the way. It will be 17 months before he returned to US soil. Gaffney's Creek, rural Victoria, Australia, 1993. Prison warder Heather Parker has helped her lover Peter Gibb and accomplice Archie Butler blast out of the Melbourne Remand Centre. Now on the run, they've crashed stolen vehicles, shot a policeman and burnt down a hotel. About 50 heavily armed members of the Dog Squad, Special Operations Group and Police Air Wing are in the area, 50 kilometres south of Mansfield. Once again, the lock-up lovers had vanished. We looked around for two or three days, couldn't find them there. There's a pretty big uh, police contingent up there. But then, a lucky break. A couple on a fishing trip report a vehicle hidden in scrub. These desperados have already shot a cop, so the police take no chances. They split up and start combing the area. Dog handler, Trevi Berriman, heads straight to the river. The dog actually stopped at the end of the beach and put its nose in the air. And he's just, Trevor's gone, I'm pulling the dog back. Um, someone's really close by. I've seen flashes coming from the bush in front of me. I thought, oh shit, someone's shooting at me. In a hail of bullets, Gibb, Parker and Butterley open fire on the police. I felt the air of the bullets go past my head. In the firefight, Officer Damien Hare takes a bullet. And that hit me just across the back of the leg there, so sort of just opened the skin up a bit. Wounded, Officer Hare keeps spraying the bushes with bullets. The fugitives return fire. There were rounds going everywhere, so I had no idea where they were coming from. It was scary. It was Horrific. Well, I basically kept firing all the way into the river, and by the time I'd actually got to the water, I was out of ammunition. Still dodging the fugitive's bullets, Dave Emke jumps in the river. Pulled the magazine off and reloaded, and then came up out of the water and started firing again. Dave Empey fires off two more magazines, 
60 bullets. All I could think was I can't see them. I know where the shots roughly came from. If I can put enough rounds into that position, maybe I'll hit one of them. The firefight lasts over half an hour. When the backup team arrives, stun grenades are pitched into the bush. When it goes quiet, a dog is sent in. He comes out covered in blood. We thought, well, there's someone in there. They're, they're, they're either there and not that well or there and dead. Uh, a couple of more stun grenades were thrown into his position or there close to it and um, there was nothing, so we slowly approached and found him dead. Butler was dead. Forensic tests would reveal he was not killed by a police bullet. My guess is that one of the other two fired at us and one of the other two shot him. But Gibb and Parker's getaway was short-lived. The whole area was surrounded by police and they were quickly captured. Peter Gibb and warder Heather Parker have been formally charged with attempted murder and numerous other offences following the dramatic shootout with police in northeastern Victoria. Peter Gibb was sentenced to eight years for his offences. Heather Parker got five. But in an ironic twist, lovers' luck would favour them again. Gibb was acquitted of the armed robbery for which he had received his initial 12-year sentence. It meant he was out of jail six months ahead of Heather Parker. These once locked up lovers still live in Melbourne and today are the parents of two young sons. Next, back up, uh, again, we're in pursuit. Richard McNair meets the Mounties Please, get out of the in a dramatic chase through the Canadian forest. Robin brothers Ken and Keith Littlejohn have escaped from Mountjoy Prison. But Keith broke his ankle jumping from the wall. Let's go! What? Let's go! To allow his older brother to get away, Keith convinces Ken to leave him behind. Within minutes, Keith is recaptured. With one brother on the run, speculation is rife about who sprung them from jail. The Little Johns had to have had assistance in this escape. I just can't see them being able to do it without. Where did they get the hacksaw blades? Why were there no prison officers? And why were these planks against the wall? And why was Kenneth Little John not um, captured very shortly after his escape? There have been ideas about it, different ideas. They were maybe helped by the British. I don't think they were, because the escape was, was, was a poor escape in one sense. But they were just lucky. Who helped him? Could it be MI6 wanting to get some of their old spooks out? Did the security services of England help you escape? Oh, not at all. They would... I think they'd like to see us dead, not out. I mean, we must be an embarrassment. There was no assistance whatsoever? None whatsoever. Ken eventually resurfaced in Holland. To the British government's acute embarrassment, he went public, claiming to be a pawn of MI6. I was a mug. A crook, a fall guy, a patsy. I was used, abused. Despite his one-man campaign to exonerate himself, the British government never officially admitted to having dealings with the Little John brothers. Helped by friends and living off stash money, Kenneth Littlejohn spent an amazing 20 months on the run. But on a return visit to England, he was spotted and extradited back to Ireland to serve out the rest of his sentence. Ken and Keith were eventually released in 1981 on condition they never returned to Ireland. It would be pointless to try and make myself out to be some knight in shining armor or as angelic because I'm not. And the whole thing is particularly Bizarre and unsavoury. MI6 spies or just plain desperate criminals? For the last 20 years, the Little Johns have been off the police radar. 
Pollock Penitentiary, Louisiana, 2006. Convicted murderer Richard Lee McNair has smuggled himself out of prison, cocooned in a pallet of mailbags. He is now one of America's most wanted, with a $25,000 reward on his head. The whole time we're receiving leads, literally hundreds of leads a week, and from the general public, sightings, possible sightings of Mr. McNair. McNair vanishes until constables Nelson Levesque and Stéphane Gagnon spot a suspicious van in New Brunswick. As we approached a red light on Andrew at Water Street, uh, right here downtown Camelton, we, uh, we noticed that there was a white panel van in front of us and it had an Ontario plate. So we were in the process of doing all the checks. As the light uh, switched for green, we uh, activated the emergency equipments. And uh, at that point, we, we thought that he was going to stop. At the wheel, McNair pulls away sharply. He shows no sign of stopping. At that point, there was a back lane. He never stopped to see if there was any vehicle coming. He just uh, blew off from that intersection, uh, went towards a little kiosk, and there he went off-road, hit the rock, almost lost control of the van. South ball on Andrew. We'll be in pursuit. At that point, the Constable Goyon was doing a good job with keeping up with him, and he, the uh, the white panel van just slammed on the brake, the, the driver. So at that point, I got out of the, of the car um, and uh, I started approaching the vehicle. As I was in the process of doing this, he left again. We had no um, explanation for why he was fleeing from us. Uh, we just thought it could have been uh, contraband cigarettes, a stolen vehicle that had not been reported stolen yet. Requesting backup uh, again, we're in pursuit, Alpha 6 in pursuit. With backup on the way, the Mounties play cat and mouse through the town until McNair makes a mistake. He's now in the uh, provincial uh, parking lot. He has nowhere to go. We'll be blocking the entrance and the exit. We saw him going back and forth in the in the alley, like in the parking lot. He, he was not going anywhere. At that point, we believed that he had seen us, and he was just like he didn't know what to do. So um, my partner kind of blocked the entrance, which is the exit at the same time of that parking lot, and I went on foot towards the van. At that point, he went down the hill towards the uh, the back road of the hospital. Hey, he's going off road. McNair guns the van up the dirt road, and as backup arrives. The mountains give chase. Okay, city dispatch was located. The van it's in the trail behind the provincial hospital. Hitting a dead end, McNair bolts from the van and flees into the forest. Constable Gaillon and I run towards the van. We have to make sure that there's nobody else in the van for officer safety reason. We don't know if there's any weapons involved. Um, so at that point, um, Constable Gaillon went to the left. I keep going to the right. I saw the suspect just, just in front of me, and I tried to, to cut the distance of him, and I, uh, I, tagged him, I tagged him on the ground. Gave him command at that point. A couple of strikes were applied around the rib cage, soft empty end techniques, and he released pressure. Handcuffs were applied. He said, Let me catch my breath. He repeated that uh, a couple of times. Um, and uh, there he said, uh, You guys won, I lost. And he said, uh, You guys will be heroes. And so we did not know what he meant by that. At, at that point, we only had an unknown individual running from the police. In the van, the Mounties find a taser gun and large hunting knives, but they still have no idea who they've captured. He said, you guys got a big fish? He said, I'm uh, Richard Lee McNair, a convicted uh, uh, murderer from the US and I escaped from jail. After eluding capture for 18 months, Richard Lee McNair finally lost the game he played so well. He was reincarcerated to serve his three life sentences, plus an extra two and a half years for his prison break. Next time, a great train robber makes a great escape. The prisoners all shouting out to one another out the cell windows, well done, boys. 
In America, a prison nurse falls for a felon and springs him from jail. You can talk me out of your underwear, I'm telling you. And in Australia, an escape proof bunker is no match for Mad Dog Cox. When he had a weapon, his behavior was absolutely uncontrollable. Thank you.